Um, so in fact, uh, I'm actually going to be talking about powers for so I, I've tailored this presentation really for for where we are in Wales, because obviously I do quite a lot of talks um, about early mining. Um, but I'm certainly going to introduce some of the work I've done in Keredigian because it's a, it's a good way to understand what might be there in Powys, but we're only just seeing the tip of. So this, uh, this in fact, is this you know really dramatic picture here is actually of one of the sites I'll be talking about, uh, Nantaraira mine and the upper reaches of the River Severn, Nantaraira Snowbrook mine. So this map of uh, Wales shows with the the borders of um, of the area of Powys shows the the, the um, seven sites here which I'll be talking about, um, ranging from uh, uh, fr from the early Bronze Age, so this, uh, the end of the third millennium, beginning of the second millennium BC, right up to um, the Roman and early medieval period. Um, and so we're pretty well represented. Uh, things have really changed, I think, over the last 20 years is that, that we're beginning, these sites are beginning to turn up, or we're beginning to recognize, we're beginning to date them and beginning to investigate them more. So this, I'm sorry about this rather glary colored uh, geological map here from the BGS, but it's a simplified one and it just shows the geological setting of of those areas I showed on the previous map, where we've where we, some of the sites we've been investigating. So we're obviously in the central Wales ore field and the Plinlimon area, these upper Ordovician, lower Silurian shells and grit stones, and these sort of southwest, uh, northeast uh, trending fractures, mineral veins. Um, also, the small area in the Barrowin Mountains in the Ordovician volcanics there, and this other area right on the border between Wales and England at um, Clannamanach on this Carboniferous Limestone Ridge, these outcrops which follow Offa's Dyke. Offa's Dyke follows them, I should say. Okay, so I'm going to start trying to give a little introduction about Bronze Age Mines. Obviously, I, I imagine I have talked to some of you before about this subject um this is just a reconstruction of of the uh, early work in on copper hill and keradigion and the kamas with the end of the kamas with valley um but i i think it's useful to drill a little bit into this just to give you an idea of the the, the period and what's happening over the british isles in terms of prospection at the very beginning of those metalworking periods and how important Wales is to the whole story. Okay, so this, this map here of Britain Island really shows these areas. And we can see on, over in the Southwest Island, um, uh, Ross Island mines and Mount Gabriel mines. Ross Island was working in 2400 BC. So this is in third millennium BC, and it's associated with the Beacon Mining Camp. So there's a good sort of cultural association a clue as to the people who are connected with this prospection, which became really widespread across Britain. But what I'm obviously going to draw your attention to now is is the mainland mainland Britain and those three areas. So we have um, central the central Wales area, which obviously I'm talking about in Powys, and the North Wales coast, which is the Monmouth Paris Paris Mountain and very famous Great Orme Mine which was working in the Middle Bronze Age, from the early to Middle Bronze Age. And also another group which you might, you might be less well aware of, which is this Central England Southern Pennine group, which are these copper, copper deposits, again, in the Carboniferous Limestone, rather like the Great Orm um, at, um, at Ecton, and also in the Triassic Sandstones at Alderley Edge. But in the lower picture here, you can see these... Uh, uh, 15 early Bronze Age mines, which have been identified, excavated and dated now within the Central Wales ore field. And this is the largest group in the British Isles. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it really is sig significant. Um, and of course, there's, there's three mines we've identified in Powys. So this, these are uh, small scale mining, but also prospection sites, I would say. Some of them are very small. 
uh, work between 2200 period, 2200 to 1600 BC. And then, of course, we have the main mining period on the Great Orm, which during the Acton Park metalwork period, and, and you may be aware of Alan Williams' new book that's just been published, which describes that in a lot of detail. It's a very good piece of research. This this Acton Park metalwork period, which the, the, the corp from there supplied copper for these Middle Bronze Age pearl staves. But returning to Mid Wales, you can see there this group uh, along the Ceredigion coast inland on the on the uh the west side of the cambrian mountains and a few sites on the east side in paris this is uh, uh we now have more than 100 radiocarbon dates for the mines in britain um and peter marshall um has uh uh carried out bayesian analysis so be modeling the dates and so there's something rather useful we can say about them so mining most probably started during the last qu quarter of the third millennium BC in mid Wales, and there's an eighty percent probability of that. And we're always dealing with probabilities, of course, when we try to analyse large amounts of radiocarbon data. British mines they seem to fall into three distinct groups: mid Wales, North Wales, and Northwest Central England. And the model shows a likely order for the start of mining activity in these three areas starting with mid wales then going to the north wales coast then to northwest central england now this is actually really quite interesting because the earliest dated mines that we have in 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 uh west central wales are actually in the coastal strip and uh i i think there's a you know th this sort of matches a sort of pattern and, and a model we're suggesting that mining you know the prospection move was from ireland into the west of britain and then it moved for further eastwards and this makes perfect sense now with the, the dating that we're getting for all of these sites so i want to give you as i said i want to give you this uh, you know drill down a bit deeper into this one really good ex example of an excavated upland Bronze Age, early Bronze Age mine in Wales, which is the Comet Load Open Cast uh, Copper Hill in Camusquith. So it's about 25, 20, 25 kilometres inland of Aberystwyth along the Uswith Valley, towards the head of the valley on the western side of the Cambrian Mountains. So this is about sort of 420 uh, metres above, above sea level. So it's in, within the Welsh uplands. We carried out archaeological excavations here between 1989 and 1999 and it was uh, 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 quite a detailed and and may I say backbreaking work that all of this or everything we we did had to be done uh, we, we, everything had to be taken up the hill and, it, and it, logistically it was a, a big exercise just give you, I'm just going to run through a, a, a few pictures to give you the, the idea of what some of these Bronze Age mines, when they're excavated, look like. So this is a mine gallery that's been worked with stone tools, this beautifully carved roof here and fire setting. This is in the Comet Load open cast. Uh, this is about two metres below ground. These pictures on the left-hand side, you get an idea of the, the, the logistics of of excavating these sites this is we we were digging down to eight meters below ground level um and stepped in step sections and using uh, uh shoring but i think the amazing thing here is is that this is a pristine site um it it's completely sealed by an effectively more than three three and a half thousand years of natural mine uh, natural sedimentation in filling the original working so it's a beautiful site not only for the archaeology buried archaeology but for the paleo environmental record of its following its abandonment on the right hand side we see this rock cut entrance here this is one of the most interesting areas of the mine and it's turned up lots of artifacts within the working area they were mining here but they're also processing ores within within the front half of the mine lots and lots of organic materials were coming out from these waterlogged sediments uh this is an example of for example this is a 
a fragment of a creel type basket which is reconstructed there um it's, it'd obviously been damaged it'd been thrown down as it was a damaged item it'd been thrown into the nearest fire set and you must remember these these mines are worked using fire to break up the rock and then using stone tools and antler tools to excavate the rock out and and expose the mineral veins here we have sort of like rope we have lots of rope and um uh ties for tying things up uh, all made of of hazel corollas uh corollas with is this is a an antler pick made of a red deer antler uh, we found a number of these and lots and lots of smaller fragments. And they're very heavily used. They're quite unlike you, the sort of antler picks you find in sort of henge monuments in, in chalk landscapes where they look almost pristine. Here, when you're walking, working against really hard quartz veined rocks, they wear down really quickly. And you can see the, the tine, which is the pick end, has worn down completely. And then it's been turned around on the crown and used as a hammer. So, you know, this, this tool has, has become defunct, but then it's been used as a tool in a different way. These are uh, very well preserved and copper stained, a lot of the bone and antler tools. This is a, a, a fragment of a, a withy handle, for one of these hammer stones. So you can see the reconstructions. We've done a lot of ex experimental work with these, working out how they were used on underarm against the fire set rock. This was found in the mine and we also found the other half of the same it broken and they just dropped it straight in front of this and walked straight over it and made another one and so you're walking you know walking across these debris layers that are left by the miners by far the most important find was this all the wood lawn dyers in fact this is half of it still in situ it was a five meter long straight hollowed out uh, uh, gutter for carrying water over the working floors of the mine and the the back that it was still actually in position supported on stone supports and brushwood and the angle to take the water away from where it was seeping in at spring heads within the mine so drainage was obviously an important thing here what was really nice about it we've got all the the working marks uh, of the uh, use of uh, metal axes, flat axes and, and wooden wedges on the side. This is now in the National Museum of Wales, along with all the other finds from this site. This is just a reconstruction of a whole series. We found a whole series of wooden launders. That was the best wooden launder. A lot of the others were, were quite poorly preserved, but we, we it's clearly these were part of a system of wooden launders for managing water within the mine, presumably from draining it, but we think also using in the entrance area for washing the ore and for separating, doing gravity, a small amount of gravity separation of some of the minerals. Okay, so let's look at some of the Bronze Age mines in Powys, just on the other side of the Cambrian Mountain watershed. Um, I'm, I'm, in fact, I'm going to start first of all with a mine very close to the Davi Estuary, which is number one, which is Park Lodge Mine, copper mine at Mahantlef. So Park Lodge um, Mine was also known uh, traditionally as Ogoff Withen. And this is really quite interesting because I think the point I'd like to make here is that many of these features on the landscape were known about hundreds of years presumably but not recognized as mines there was no no concept of, you know they, they come from a period where there was actually no mining in these areas and so they're often got names like you know holes or in this case as a cave ogoff with them which i believe is um is uh it's a mutation but it probably means cave of the wizard uh and there's a legend of course about it you know ogoff with was haunted by ghost hobgoblins and fairies who played occasional pranks on old crones and timid maids. Who, so it's quite a romantic sort of thing. Even in the 19th century, they, they, this, this tradition persists. But in 1869, this was rediscovered by a local miner and was even then referred to as an ancient Roman working when, he found, uh, when they found examples of stone tools 
and some later tools as well. In 1972, Morris thought this was a, a medieval mine, I think because within a lot of these sites, as we'll see also at Nantera, as well as the stone tools, they found in the, the complete infill of this feature some iron tools as well, which is exactly what you you know, because this is effectively a sink and there's always people coming back. And so the upper layers have got later tools in, but not a lot of them because most of the later work was very small scale, medieval or early post-medieval. Um, so this, you know, our, we, we were coming to this site for a number of years when we were surveying mines in central Wales, and we we were obviously aware of Ogoth with them, and um, we were always intrigued by it, but frustrated at the same time because we couldn't find any examples of the stone tools that had been talked about in the uh, antiquarian reports. And... Um, uh, and I think, basically, there was so much hill wash covering the early tips that absolutely nothing was visible. But in 1996, I was contacted by John Mason, who's a, a, a well-known geologist in the area who visits a lot of the mines doing his work. And he said there's a badger set that, 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 that has just turned up in on the edge of the uh, of the small open cast there and in right in the middle of the spoil of the badger set is a stone tool he was absolutely right and there it was and that and that was the beginning of our work and so you know in in 1997 we car carried our load of test pitting and some trenching all the way around to find where the early spoil tips were and got um stone tools and charcoal from fire setting for radiocarbon dating and this is written up in in aw37 in fact there's the radiocarbon date there so this is very much it fits into that uh that range of early bronze age activity that i, I already mentioned you know very typical dates on for about 1900 to about you know mid 1600 uh cal bc um and we have a number of other uh dates from there as well so the, the hammerstones um this is perhaps a good example of some of the hammerstones that are coming out of these powis and keridigian mines of course um but in this case uh, there's some really nice examples you can see the one on the left there it hasn't actually been grooved, but it's been notched alternately from one side and then from the other side to take a withy, a handle around it. And uh, the flat broken cobble has been used as a mortar. So these are very utilitarian tools that are just picked up and reused and then picked up again, thrown down, then picked up again and used for something else. What was really interesting, I think, about Ogoff Withen or Park Lodge Mine is that uh, John Mason was convinced and he could show that the hammerstones were beach cobbles, but not only had they been brought from the coast, but they'd been brought very specifically from one place because of them, the numbers of, of Cadiridris volcanics and dolerites that were within the assemblage. And he said that the nearest place and the likely place was from the mouth of the Avon de Sunny near Tovanai, which is just north of Tawin. Um, so that was really quite interesting to make these links, you know, in terms of their resources, where they were bringing the stone tools from. They just seemed like cobbles, but they knew they needed really good cobbles. And so they were going specifically to try to get these volcanics. So having mentioned the, 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 stone, the cobblestones, the mining tools, uh, there have been cobblestones collected from the coast. I'd just like to sort of draw you, your attention to this sort of um, map we've done of, of the, some of the Central Wales ore field Bronze Age mines. So these early bronze, all early Bronze Age mining sites. And to look to just to show that west, west of the uh, Cambrian Mountain watershed, uh, at least 70% of the stone tools that we find at the mines have all been brought from the coast, often up the river valley, like at Kamaswith. They're, they're all, 70% of them probably uh, seem to be beach cobbles, so they've been brought inland by the miners. 
but east of that Cambrian Mountain Divide. And that's a real, seems to be a geographic sort of um, barrier that you know, the stones, the, the, the cobbles they're using for stone mining tools are either collected from the rivers or from the glacial till, or rarely they're also quarried from the actual hard rock outcrops. So it's a really quite, it's a real sort of distinction between these two, two different areas, you know, one in Keredigian and one in Powys on the other side of the Cambrian Mountain Divide. I also like to point out these prospection areas, which we think is to do connected to the original woodland clearance for pasturage during the, during the Bronze Age and consequent erosion on the valley size, uh, revealing mineral veins. So pastoralism and uh, prospection are probably intimately linked together. This is, this is what I think. So moving in, up into the, the, up into the, the onto the onto the slopes of Plin Plin Lemon, Plin Lemon, sorry, is uh, the Nantarero Snowbrook mine. Um, I mean, this is again. You can see the more detail here. This dramatic picture of this gorge. I think what we're looking at here is not just the Bronze Age mine, although we think this is the extent of the Bronze Age mine laterally, but it's been deepened by medieval and post medieval working. But what we have got preserved is remains of the bronze age spoil and hammerstones on the bank or on the, the the banks of this big open cast working so the mine was rediscovered in 1858 by captain reynolds um and he gives the dimensions of it which are much much the less the di dimensions we have today but he only records 33 tons of lead ore so there was no sign of copper ore then and in fact, there was very little sign of any war. It was basically an emptied mine. Um, but what he did find were stag's horn, which is obviously an antler pick, and a stone ball and an iron pick, which are in the Duke of Northumberland's museum in Annick Castle. Oliver Davies came here in 1938 as part of the British Association uh, investigation of early mines and recovered charcoal and stone tools. So hard on his heels, well, a bit of a time gap here, but we came to reinvestigate Oliver Davies' work in 1988. And uh, it was a summer to remember. Not It was a very successful summer, but um, all the odds were against it. it was, it's, we were working for a week in continual rain, and when it wasn't raining, it was uh we were just working in clouds of midges and then there was horse flies and it was basically uh, uh it, it was it was it was a sort of terrifying ordeal but uh we we didn't find we did in fact find what we were after at the end of it despite of it and we see you can see the ex the example of this section cut through one of the tips that oliver davies describes and you can even see from here, the amount of dark, you know, the dark, the, the, the presence of charcoal throughout there. The, because the rock is so hard of the um, upper Ordovician sandstones there, they require required an awful lot of fire setting. So the use of fuel in this mine must have been enormous. And hence, one imagines that the results were worth it. Presumably, oxidized copper minerals in the upper part of this copper lead load. We, 30 years later, uh, remembering our trials in that summer of 1988, we thought we'd better come back and, 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 and revisit this and, and carry out some more work to really sort of uh, support some of our original ideas. And, uh, and what was really useful about this, that um, we basically sampled all the way along the exposed outcrop and for more than 100 meters we were finding bronze age spoil it was you know it was quite an incredible we only at that point realized how extensive those prehistoric workings were they weren't going down but they were going laterally all the way along the load so it was a significant mine and it's interesting to to you know that we we talk about the mines at Copper Hill at Kamaswith, you know, producing maybe between 10 and 
and up to 20 tons of copper metal. I'm just very much an estimate. And, um, but, you know, Nantirera may well fit into this sort of model of a medium to large size mine. Um, the other very interesting thing, as I sort of alluded to already, is that we found evidence for hammerstones being quarried from the outcrop, these hard sandstones. So they're, they're, they're using the same rock to mine the load country rock, but bearing in mind they have to very heavily fire it because they don't have anything tougher than the sandstone <laughs> from the, the rock on either side of the load in which to break the rock up. So that's probably the reason why they had to be so intensively fired this rock to get to, to, to mine. Now, this is a story here of a, of a lost mine. So uh, Nantarikit mine on the River Severn, which is, if any of you know, um, in the very headwaters of the River Severn by the Severn Break It's Net waterfall, just a little way down from that is the site of Nantarikit copper mine, which O.T. Jones refers to in 1921 in his memoir. Um, and what's very quite interesting, this, well, it's also referred to a hammer in a parochial account of the of the area of Llandidlois. It also refers to Nantariket or Cumriket. But um, as um, uh, O.T. Jones pointed out, the name is really interesting because there's an old open cut there. So in 1988, we found this mine, but we didn't survey it. And we found the open cut working, which we believe was Locus Ladron or Thieves' Den. And of course, this again alludes to exactly the same thing I was saying about Ogoff Witham is that this was a feature in the landscape which was at the time not recognized as being a mine simply because it was so ancient. Um, but it was, it was on a copper load. Um, so, in, in nine, so we came back here in 2012 desperate you know to try to find it and in fact we took two years to find this mine and what we were what had, what had actually happened is there'd been a large-scale forestry operation and the they'd filled in the open cast and destroyed the the the, the tip that ot jones talks about but what we did find was the very the location of this tip down by the river seven and the base of the tip and some datable material so this is a plan of the uh, Nantarikat mine. So you can see how close to the River Severn this is. So some of the original prehistoric workings have probably since been washed away by the river. Uh, the the Lox Ladron uh, open cast no longer exists. It's been filled in by a front and a forestry road covers it. Um, the interesting thing is from finding datable material is that it's too early. <laughs> But what's, I think what we have here is the, 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 the actual ground surface beneath, immediately beneath where we know there was a Bronze Age uh, 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 mine tip with hammer stones. And so I, I think what we're dealing with is um, uh, possibly it's, it, there's, there's some other settlement activity there or, or, or an alternative explanation is that there was original extraction here earlier, perhaps, perhaps even for pigment, bearing in mind the, the, the copper minerals and secondary copper minerals that would have been present there. We really don't know, so the jury's out on that. But it's interesting, this is all one early date, which is out of kilter, in a sense, with, with that very precise range that we have from all the other sites. Now, I'm just going to briefly sort of, this is all, uh, it's useful to sort of just ponder for a moment on this, on the model for prospection and mining during the Bronze Age in, in, the, in these upland sites in, 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 in central Wales. So, you know, what, the, what we propose is that, you know, people were moving from these coastal, the pastoral people were involved in mining and prospecting, and they were moving from the coastal winter pastures taking animals, moving them in the late spring or summer along the river valley ridge routes up, in, up into, the, into the uplands and where there was summer pasturage 
and there would be small scale woodland clearance. And this small scale wooden clearance type Swithin type agriculture on the valley sides would have led to erosion, increased erosion, which would, might well have exposed mineral veins. And it's that exposure of mineral veins being noticed by the people who are actually occupying the area as so a pastoralist is that, you know, that's the information they're bringing back, first of all, and with samples and showing to perhaps to itinerant metal workers of the minerals they found of the knowledge exchange. And that knowledge exchange is, is affirmative, it's positive. So they go back seeing that this is a valuable, uh, you know, pastime to, to co cohabit with um, with pastoral activities. And so they became pastoralist miners. And we see this, you know, the same sort of model, animals moving in the late spring or summer, they're taking up hammer stones into the mountains, seasonally clearing for tree, you know, for, uh, for wood, for, for as well as for the animals, but also wood for fuel, for fire setting and mining, processing of the ore at valley campsites and, and carrying the, the ores ore back with them in, in, in the autumn months, meeting with metal workers and the metal workers then smelt and perhaps rather than the, the miners smelting, the metal workers are exchanging uh, ore for finished metal product, uh, finished metal pr uh, products, which are useful to the pastoralists. So in, in relation to these two uh, plin limon mines in Paris, Nantarara and Nantariket, we wanted to do some coring in the uplands. And this is in the area around plin limon and so we cored um near the source of the river seven with uh, as part of the metal links project with my colleague tim mayo who's a palynologist so we we wanted to look we we got a we recovered a two two and a half meter core from this ombrotrophic which is a rain-fed peat bog right at the source of the seven and um we uh had use of uh a, a, a core scanner, our XRF core scanner, Aberystwyth in the in the Department of Earth Sciences, and although I, I mean I tend to look at this and think it's it's not over, I don't really know how significant it is. But what's really interesting, if we look at that, the trace for silicon from this 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 um this the from this peat profile, we see there's very little clastic material coming in. So there's not material being washed into the bog, it's only a rain fed bog. And any heavy metals are coming in are liable, liable to be coming in from the atmosphere. So that's a good thing. What we can see is there are some peaks both in the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, the Roman period, and also in the very early medieval period for copper. Um, it, then they're not in terms of uh, uh, amplitude, they're not so convincing but but at least they're there and they may well relate to some small scale it is actually picking up some traces of of prospecting and mining in those upland areas what's really significant though is is we have no lead during the early period but suddenly lead are turning up in the medieval early medieval medieval periods which is very distinctive at the top of the lead trace so you know in a sense, and but but not copper. So it looks like the the interest was in copper early, and then quite a lot of lead coming out from the mines from the medieval period onwards. Okay, so let's look at Iron Age mining. So there's one site here, and this is the site of Klanemarak Ogof, which I mentioned over on the Carboniferous Limestone on the Welsh borders, just just into Powys. So this is a, uh, we went there in, in 2021 to, we got Shed Monument consent to uh, survey and excavate underground. I think this picture gives you an idea of the sort of interior of this working. In fact, it's Klanamanakogov is, is, you know, Klanamanak cave, but it's always been referred to as a mine. Well, in, in fact, it is in fact, <laughs> partly a cave and this is the one sort of revelation that we made which I, I don't know why but i don't think many this had been picked up on so much before we're actually looking into a a, a a sort of karstic tube up into the limestone here from the mine workings so there's definitely cast everywhere in within this system but we know it's also a mine because there's mineralization 
So this is looking out from the front entrance of the Ogof. So this large natural amphitheater in front of you, which is now the, um, the Llanamanach golf course, um, you know, is, uh, but you get the feeling. In fact, what we're looking at is the interior of what is the largest Iron, Iron Age hill fort in Wales, uh, Llanamanach, and, and effectively the earthworks follow the natural topography around this large amphitheater. Um, on the on the west side, we also have Offa's Dyke. So on the highest, they, they've used the highest part of this limestone ridge to uh, to erect the dike in the very early medieval period. One other thing I would say about this picture is that in the center of this natural depression is a peat mire, which has now been, of course, uh, drained for the golf course. But Jenny Moore in, in the 19, early 1970s took a peat core from here, radar carbon dated peat core, and got really interesting suggestions of peaks of copper and lead from the late Bronze Age and the Iron Age period within the peat profile. So this is a trace metals within the peat. This is the entrance to the Ogoff here. So this is a collapsed into a, a part of a chamber within the cave or mine. And it's also been quarried for stone at the front. So it's been considerably modified. But you can, you can see these small little passages going off on the top left-hand side. Now, the Klanemannach is a, is a very interesting place. I think because it's like so many of these other mines, which I've named, you know, referred to as caves, it's had a very long history of visitors and it's, it's easy to access. And it became something of a, a place to visit during the Victorian period. If ever you came to London, I would, to come and visit the Roman mine. And uh, well, long before that as well. So the uh, Edward Cloyd, uh visit here uh talked about the uh, the the mine and the cave at, in 1694 walter machen visited in 1795 pennant refers to it as a roman mine at the end of the 18th century and you see you know we, there's some nice romantic descriptions of a uh, visit descriptions of going underground here in the 19th century and so lots so many legends as well i mean there's a wonderful legend of a blind harpist who disappeared one day down the mine and he never never reappeared but he could be heard during sunday service in the local church playing his harp deep underground um but the, the, you know the, there is there's reams of information and of course uh clued uh, cpat have um done a, a very good desktop survey of the mine of the hill fort and CPAT also worked uh, when um, uh, metal detectors found human remains. The human remains turned out to be modern, but there are many other human remains here. So what's important is human remains have been found for, for more than 200 years inside the mine. And today you can still see, if you go underground, you can see hu uh, animal bone and human bone everywhere scattered it's a in a way it's a real bit of a mess underground because it's so been so heavily visited by cavers and dug into in different places um so this is a sort of cavers map of the of the workings and um there's there there's many records of finds of roman coins of oh, you know, whetstones bone pins in 1965, 39, 35 um, uh, silver denarii. Uh, so basically, it's been a, this place has been a depository of of finds over the period, with an, an awful, being an awful lot of Roman finds ending up in the mine. I think I'll just point out that some of the passages are very clearly like similar to the Great Horn. There, sort of low bedding planes some with sort of small karstic cavities going off them. And at the very end of the mine, there's a quite different character to it in the Belfry series, i.e. there's a different phase of mining with these square 
trapezoidal pit cut passages. So this is, uh, we, we basically is in uh, 2021, we had permission to cut a few sec uh, to cut small, a couple of trenches underground. In fact, we, uh, we cut sections through this speleothem, this stalagmite covered walls and mining deads underground in three locations within the entrance series here and recovered charcoal from beneath stalagmite. And then in the mandible chamber, uh, which is next, just close to a blocked entrance to the whole system, we found a stream passage. And in the base of the stream passage, there this was sediment filled, but with mining deads buried underneath. And it appears that people had come through the stream passage, but they'd been mining off the walls where copper mineralization was in the dolomite there. So this, this in fact, is a date from this site D within the mandible chamber within the uh, the edge of the stream passage where there's been copper mining which dates to them from the middle to the late iron age so this is quite a revelation but of course not surprising when you think that this site is banging within the middle of uh, an iron age hill fort so this is just the same uh, photograph of the same site and again of the uh, uh location of the radiocarbon date and above it is um for example there's a lamp niche in the roof this is not a candle niche to do with later mining this is to do with burning a torch or some oily some oil lamp uh, it's very very different it's extremely primitive type of, of lighting and we believe this was sort of uh, one of the foci of iron age working but of course we've only worked in the entrance series so far so this uh, this is a photograph here is of a similar karstic infill mineralization at the nearby Clinkley's Quarry, which is a photo courtesy of Roy Starkey. And it gives you an idea of the sort of mineralization which is no longer present that would have been taken out by perhaps the Iron Age miners. Another thing I would like to uh, bring, draw your attention to is we also have dated from beneath some of the stalagmite sections charcoal uh, seal beneath them which have returned early medieval dates and what's really interesting about this is that these early medieval dates match almost very closely the construction and uh, use of the office dyke during the period of the mercian kingdoms office dyke is only 500 meters away from so, so both these iron age and these early medieval dates make perfect sense uh, according to its location Iron Age copper smelting hearth has been discovered and excavated at Clannamanach within the hill fort and nearby at Domgay Lane at Four Crosses. So Clannamanach is a high zinc copper source, produces a regional sing signature in the Late Bronze Age and, and Iron Age. And this is sort of really important. Again, this makes perfect sense because of the nature of the mineralization of the copper carbonates with a high percentage of zinc in it that we find at Clannamanach. And very briefly, I'm just going to uh, uh, mention the, the Roman sites of uh, 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 Delive and Craigamoin, uh, Craigamoin being in the Barrowins and Delive being in the Plinimon area. At Pin Delive, uh, this is a, 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 um, a survey produced by Clued Powers Archaeological Trust by Mark Walter and, and, and Richard Hankinson, but I've adapted it and, and vi I revisited one of these sites these square hushing tanks, which are right adjacent to this Flavian period fortlet, Roman fortlet there uh, at Penicrochben. Um, so from the base of the exit, uh, lead exit from one of these square tanks, we have a radiocarbon date, which is uh, it's early medieval date. But when we bear in mind the sort of results they were getting from the Roman leets, excavating the Roman leets at Dolacothi, the annal, and the uh, Kothi leets, they from the from the uh, abandonment layers, the peat infill, they're getting uh, uh, peat layers. So basically, it's a terminus antiquem for some for an earlier use of the leets. So we don't know, but the leet these tanks could be early medieval, but based on their shape and examples from elsewhere, they're very much like Roman hushing tanks. Finally, Craig Moyne. So this is quite a stunning 
uh, aerial picture here of this large open cast on the, uh, 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 at the Krieger mine mine, working a stockwork of lead loads. Note all these small tanks fed by leap feeders along the edge on the left-hand edge of this open cast and also an earlier leap system. What's interesting here is this is almost a doppelganger for the sorts of things that we find at some of the large Roman open cast workings for gold in northwest Spain. Now, this is for lead. It's not for gold. But we know that there were fire setting. There's lots of evidence for fire setting on the, uh, the breaking up the edge of the open cut. And they were using water rather like Pliny describes it being used in northwest Spain for, for removing broken up rock. So here the, here the water, these, this hushing is being used to uh, wash away the, the, the fractured rock. Um, I have a. We, I, I did one small um, archaeological section through a late leap, late late leap feeder to the rear of the open cast, which suggests that there was also medieval medieval working here. But I think the most interesting evidence from this is another peak core that I took with Tim Mayo, where we have both Roman and early medieval lead peaks within this radiocarbon dated peak core. So thank you. Just as conclusions, so we have two, possibly three early Bronze Age mines identified in Paris within the Plinlimon area. These were relatively small mines which probably only produced a few tons of copper over an extended period of time. Near the coast, beach cobbles were used as tools, whilst the other side of the mountain divide, that's into Paris, only poorer quality river pebbles glacial cobbles and even quarried stone were used against fire set rock and for crushing ore. Recent, recent investigations at the supposedly Roman mine of Hlanemanagogov have shown that this is partly natural cave, which was worked for copper during the middle of the late Iron Age period, contemporary with the occupation of the hill fort. Again, no surprise here, but nice to prove. It may also be inactive during the period of use of Offa's Dyke, and I think we can show there was some activity in the mine. Whether it was just entry or whether they were mining, we don't know. Possible Roman hushing tanks have been identified at Pendileve. These tanks are more typical of the Roman period, although the abandonment infill that we have a date for is later. At Krieger Mine in the Berowins, the Leeton tank systems are much more complex and resemble some of the tank systems described by Pliny in Spain. There are no such dated features here, but the geochemical record from a nearby peat bog confirms both Roman and medieval activity. Mining, perhaps spelt, smelting, but, but certainly mining activity, which supports the contention that, that Krieger Moyen was worked from the Roman period onwards. Thank you.